Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, George Pine, founder and CEO of Bruin Capital. George, nice to see you. Good to be here, Andy. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about Bruin Capital for those who are not familiar with the company. Tell us about what you guys do. Well, we're a global company, so we operate. We have people on the ground in 16 countries. We do business in 50 countries, and we um, invest in you know sports-related companies, a lot in technology you know, around the disruption, the change in how content's being distributed. So it might be a data company, might be a tech stack and gambling, might be a web or app or OTT uh, developer. Um, so, you know, gl very global, and we really work with almost every major league and federation, you know, in the world. So Bruin has nothing to do with the Boston Bruins. It has to do with where you played college football, That's right? That's right, Brown Bruins. When I played, uh, they were the Brown Bruins. Did they changed the mascot? They changed to the Bears, actually. Is that right? I had no idea. So I stuck with the Bruins, and you know, it was great. I saw Mark Milley this morning, and, uh -huh. and he knew. He knew, it was, he, knew I, he knew it was Brown Bruins. Of course, he played for Princeton, so he knew. Oh, he did? Yeah. Head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, That's right? That's right. Yeah, I yeah. had no idea he played football at Princeton. Wow, you guys had a lot of talk. Oh, he's about. a hockey player. Oh, a hockey player. Okay, to be clear. Okay, um, so George, a lot of people are talking about sports being an asset class now. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good investment opportunity. You know, for the last 30 years, the value of team franchises has grown at double-digit kagers. And there are very few things that have done that consistently for 30 years. And that's been driven by two things, three things really. The scarcity, there's only so many franchises. Media rights, sports are the most valuable form of media uh, going. And then the engagement with the consumer in sports is unlike really anything else. So those three things have c created an asset class that people have invested a lot of money and made a lot of money in. Yeah, let's talk more about the, the technology part because, you know, really that is just so multifaceted. I mean, everyone talks about phones, yes, and, and how that changes the fan experience. How does that reflect some of your investment ideas? Well, we, we believe, again, that the way that games are going to be consumed are going to be different. So they're going to be on your device, and also the content's going to be different. You're going to have short and long-form content. People are 19 times more likely to uh, watch a game if they bet on it. So we are investing in data and technology around the change in consumption, and we're also investing in the one-to-one -one relationship between the club or the franchise and the consumer, you know. and so. Those our investments reflect that growth because there's a big tailwind there, and that's the you know kind of the future of sports, but also the future of business, right? Technology is disrupting business. Technology is disrupting sports. Invest around the change. One thing um, we should mention, of course, is sports betting, and I know that's a, another facet of change here. Something you guys are keen on as well. How does that working for you? Well, I just think sports betting engages the hardcore consumer. In, in ways that you know they hadn't been able to do before. Like I said, you're more likely to watch a game if you bet on it. Also, it makes games that are not good relevant because you might be able to bet on in-game betting. So a game that might be 21 to nothing is now interesting because you can bet on different activities within a game that might not be close or competitive. So I think it enriches the relationship uh, with the hardcore consumer in a way that you know was, wasn't available before. Your family played sports here. Father, grandfather, I think what's a third generation NFL players in your family? Yeah, so my dad played in the NFL, my granddad played in the NFL, my brother played in the NFL. I played in college, my oldest boy played in college. Last year, my uh, youngest boy, Drew, was a quarterback at, at Notre Dame. So we've, uh, sports is important, of course, and the best athlete was my father in law, who played in the Masters 13 times and had four top 10 finishes. So uh, we, sports was always important. Is that something you need to be an executive in sports, though? Do you have to have played the game? No, and you know, it's funny. The sports I, I learned uh, from were sports I knew nothing about, so I, I ran NASCAR. It was there for 11 years. Uh, my wife taught me how to drive a stick shift, and I never changed Motorola in my life. So, and then I was in golf and tennis, and I, I haven't golfed in 23 years. So I always worked in sports that I was not you know, familiar with, on the one hand. On the other hand, being around competitors, understanding what fans like. There probably was some benefit from being around sports my whole life. I, I knew what it was like to be a sports fan. And when you're running a league or federation, I know what it's like to compete and how much you care. And I'd say it was an advantage for me, but it was more, it wasn't quite as obvious at NASCAR, I suppose. You mentioned your son was playing quarterback in Notre Dame. He's transferred to ASU, Arizona State for next season. But I was watching a Notre Dame game and they did cutaways of you in the stands 
What is that like watching your son playing on the big stage like that? Well, you know, it's like any other parent. You know, you're 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 rooting for him and his ups are your ups and his downs are da your downs. So, uh, you know, Notre Dame is a big a big platform. You know, it's the only team in uh, in America that's on national TV for every game, pro or college. Uh, but it was a great privilege to have him play there. He made great friends, and it was a great experience for him. I want to ask you about um, this concept. Uh, I think you alluded to it, George, which is sort of the fan and, and the lifetime commitment one often makes to a team. How can that be manifested in investing? What does that mean for a business if you have a fan that's going to be a customer, essentially, for you know, 70 years or something? Right? right. I think if you look at the way that sports has been consumed, right, it went from and, and B to B to C, so it was never really B to C in terms of, of media. Now it's B, you can go B, direct to consumer with media. Um, and also fans have so many more challenges. Think about it, someone sends you season tickets and the next time you'd hear from the team was when the renewal was coming. Uh, now, through because content's being distributed differently, I can have a one-to-one -one relationship with you and I can have a deeper relationship. I can send you content on many different platforms that might be compelling to you. And if you, if I'm not doing these things, somebody else in some other form of entertainment will be. So I think going forward in sports, the relationship that you build by using the content that you can, you can generate on these many different platforms is the future. And that's marketing to you, Andy, one, one person at a time. I know what you like. I know what you don't like. I know at what price you're going to move, what prices you're not going to move. And that knowledge base is really the future, I think, of sports. And what makes sports unique is that the engagement with the consumer and the affinity in sports, you know, I'm an Alabama fan, I'm a Tennessee fan, I'm a Liverpool fan, that engagement is high. So that uh, success rate should be much higher in marketing to that, that particular person. So I think that's the future of the sports business. It's still in the early stages because, again, content was distributed and still is primarily distributed. B to B to C, but it's going to go more direct to consumer in terms of live games and then, of course, other short form content, which is evolving. I mean, we heard today about TikTok and the impact of the Kansas State basketball team and how that it's, it's driven a lot of uh, interest because of TikTok. So these other platforms and one to one opportunities now exist that didn't, you know, years, years ago. The rights are very expensive, though, still, right? I mean, that's like still the big boys game, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I mean, look, sports drives television. You know, uh, scripted television, you know, really, it's news and sports. And so sports is, you know, it gets large audiences, and so it's very valuable. But that other ancillary c uh, content, pre and post game, the day in the life, you know, the, the Formula One and Netflix series, the other forms of content are, are still compelling. And athletes today, when you think about Ronaldo and Messi, and you know, they got four or six hundred million users on social media. These guys are platforms that you know that, that didn't exist years ago. So all that's in, churning up now, and it's going to create new economic opportunities and new parts of the value chain that didn't exist before. You talked about Messi and Ronaldo, and you know, obviously, global football soccer stars. American sports for the most part, aren't as global. I mean, I guess the NBA could make the case that they are. Why do you think that is, and do you think American sports will get more global? Well, well certainly the NBA is pretty pretty global, right? Yes. They're in China, Europe, basketball is a global game. Africa, it's kind of coming. Yeah, Africa, right. right. It's, by the way, that, that the valuation that they've offered to invest has uh, increased significantly in Africa, so I think you know that's a new frontier. You know, I, I wouldn't shortchange the NFL either. What they've done in the UK and what they're likely to do in Germany is, is not insignificant. So I think, and I think you, you have to begin to think global because you're, you're seeing a lot of the international football uh, or soccer come to the States. So I think you're going to see more and more global activity. And Formula One, of course, is global. Right. I want to go back a little bit to uh, talking about brewing capital and, and sports as an investment class. What is it like going out there and, and pitching what you guys have to offer investors? Is it, has it been difficult? Is it getting easier? Is sports as an asset getting more acceptance? I think there's a lot of acceptance and a lot of interest in sports. What's different for us really than anybody else is we're really operationally focused. A lot of people might invest in a club or a team or a federation. We're the business around sports and we really have operational expertise. The other thing is we've become an importer of really good sports companies to the U.S. and now we're exporting across Australia, 
North America and Europe. So we have a, a very global network that we're able to open markets to companies that they couldn't open before. And so it's the operational expertise, the relationships in that global network that Bruin has, it's, it's really quite different than really anything else out there. And that's the lane that we're in you know, today. It doesn't mean we won't go in different lanes in the future, but that lane right now is the one that we're in, and it's working. Let me ask you then, and final question here, George, where do you see Bruin Capital, say, five or ten years from now? What are your aspirations? Yeah, I, you know, I think continuing to do bigger and bolder things and be at the forefront of change, of global sports, and I think there's a real opportunity to bolster our, our, our franchise. Eventually, we're going to have to go into Asia, and eventually, we'll have to be more in India. But I think Bruin has real global, uh, to be a disruptor on the global sports stage. George Pine, founder and CEO of Bruin Capital, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you, Andy.